¿Qué más queda de decir? ¿Mm? Adiós, hijo. Adiós, papá. Hey, guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to talk about Better Call Saul Season 6, Episode 3. Rockin' Hard Place was a heavy episode where everything happened just how it had to. But even knowing 100% that it couldn't turn out differently, based on the characters that were involved, I was still breathless on the edge of my seat, hoping there might be a way. It was brutal, it was beautiful, it gave us a world-class performance, and it leaves you with a feeling that's hard to shake. I'll recap everything that happened and let you know what I thought about it right after this quick spoiler warning. If you haven't watched the third episode of Better Call Saul's sixth season, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. The episode opens with a teaser that's set in the desert. You see that there's a storm approaching above, and the camera moves over the ground until it finds its way to a blue flower that it focuses on. The rain starts to fall as you notice a piece of broken glass that tells you that something has happened here. After the opening credits, we catch back up with Nacho, who we last saw fleeing the motel's parking lot in a shot-up truck that didn't get him very far. He leaves that behind, he runs into a nearby field, and comes across an old tanker. And with no other options, he decides to get inside. Luckily, there's still a bit of oil inside, so he's able to submerge himself, and he manages to hold his breath long enough to wait out the initial search. This is a great visual representation of what Nacho is going through at the moment, but also what he's been dealing with for the last several seasons. The thought of being covered with oil, it's the kind of thing where you can't just wash that off. And it's like a reflection of his inability to get out of the game or convince his father that they need to run away. The decisions he made before got him into this desperate situation, and now here he is, he has no shelter, no place to hide, no phone, no food, no one to trust, he knows that everyone on both sides wants him dead, and all he can do is wait, inside a can, covered with sludge. After dark, he makes his way to an auto mechanic shop to try to rinse himself off. This turns out to be his one break because the middle-aged man that's there doesn't want to get involved. He lets him stay there without asking any questions. He uses his phone and the first call he wants to make is to his father. There isn't much hope here. He says, I just wanted to hear your voice and you believe him. There's nothing either one of these men can say to each other to change the reality of what's happening. His father doesn't know the specifics, but he knows enough to understand Understand that things will never be right unless Nacho gets himself out of this situation. He offers the only advice that makes sense from his perspective. He tells him to go to the police one more time. Nacho knows this isn't an option, and by now that there's no escape. So what else is there left to say? They say goodbye, and the gravity of things really starts to set in. This is tragic because it always seemed like Nacho tried to protect his father in relation to how dangerous his situation was. He knew the only way they could get out would be to run together, and his father wouldn't go for that. He never really presented it in that way. He never put that on him and instead tried to handle things himself, which is what got him to where he's at in this moment. This call is just a step in accepting the sacrifice he knows he has to make to protect the thing he cares about the most. Then he makes the call that we saw from the other side in episode 2. This time we hear what he's saying to Mike and the proposal that he makes to Gus. He'll come back and forfeit his life in exchange for his father getting away free and clear. A little while later in a warehouse, you see how he gets back into the country. Mike pulls him out of a truck. He gives him some takeout food. And while he's eating, he learns that his life will end tomorrow. They leave it there and then Victor comes down the stairs. Nacho learns that he looks too pretty to give up his life for Gus's failed attempt on Lalo's. Mike agrees to take care of it and then he pulls out a bottle to share a last drink with what is essentially a dead man walking. What we know has to happen is inevitable. The choices that set things in motion were made a long time ago. These are two people playing the cards they were dealt and time is running out for one of them. 
When Gus arrives at the chicken farm to brief the freshly roughed up Nacho, you get the idea of how things are supposed to play out. He needs to confess his involvement with Alvarez and the Peruvians, the Bolsa, but then make a run for it so that Victor can kill him before he's handed over to the Salamancas, which will deprive them of their chance to kill him slow. It's a small consideration, but it's not nothing because I don't even want to think about what they might have done if they were given the chance. Outside, Mike lobbies Gus to let him be there for insurance, not right there, but nearby. And that leaves Nacho by himself, where we see him pour a glass of water, and then notice that the glass that Gus broke is still in the garbage can. The next morning, they drop Mike off on the approach to the meeting, and keeping with the inevitability of it all, and there not being anything left to say, they just nod to each other as a goodbye. You see that Mike takes up a position to watch how things play out on the same ridge where he was going to kill Hector back in the season 2 finale. When Tyrus tells Nacho to turn around so he can put on the zip tie, you see that he's palmed a piece of glass that he got from Gus's trailer and that we saw on the ground in the opening teaser scene. The van arrives, Bolsa, the cousins, and Hector are all waiting. They bring him out and he tells him, today you're gonna die, but there are good deaths and there are bad deaths, and he gives him a chance to come clean about who hired him. As he's telling him that, you can see the torture implements waiting for him inside. Nacho delivers what he's supposed to say. He fulfills his obligation to Gus and knows that Mike has pledged to protect his father. And then he takes the opportunity to end things on his terms. He tells them that he was being paid for years, but he would have done it for free. He lets the Salamancas know what he thinks of them, and then tells Hector that he's the one that put him in that wheelchair. He uses the piece of glass to get out of the zip tie, grabs Bolsa's gun, and lets the fear of what might happen next sink in for a moment. And then he turns it on himself to end his life his way. It was rough, but a great ending for an amazing character, one that will certainly be missed, this is one of those situations where you know how it's going to play out because these other characters, we know how their stories end and it still managed to be intense. He wanted it to turn out differently, but he managed to make it a good death, the best possible death he could hope for at that point. And if I ever find myself sucking down Jello, I will think of Nacho. And I will come back around to talk about this more at the end. I broke things up this way because I figured Nacho's ending was in the front of everyone's minds, but also because looking at that, looking at what he was up against, it kind of puts Kim and Jimmy's plans into perspective. And where it was Nacho who saw what Jimmy couldn't back when they first met in season one, this time it's Huel that points it out. We find Jimmy at home taking a painting down from the wall. This is the same painting we saw coming down the stairs in the episode 1 teaser that I mentioned in my golden toilet video, and we see here how it holds some significance in that pre-Easter egg category that Peter Gould was talking about. On the back, there are a number of post-it notes laying out their plan for taking down Howard. Some of them look familiar. There's a carrot and one for the tour of the country club. And then there are some others saying things like costume, Tuesday 9A, phone call, casting, and Jay Stangle. He moves one that says paint and replaces it with one that says namaste, which is referring to Howard's license plate. From their conversation, you pick up that they were planning on getting a copy of Howard's car to use in their plan, but they're running out of time. In the first of our reminders that Kim is the one who is way more pumped up about this plan, she throws out the idea of using his real car, as in stealing Howard's car. Jimmy is quick to point out the risks that that would involve, but then he reconsiders. He brings up something called the valet scam and says it has Huel's name written all over it. The idea of pulling a scam like this off turns things around for him and you can see that Kim responds to the spark when she kisses him. But so far, I still think he's more going along with things rather than being fully committed. When they get to the courthouse, she passes off a file on one of her clients to ADA Erickson, who's surprised by the gesture because it's something they would have never come up with on their own. She thinks about that, and then she calls after Kim to tell her she has something she wants to show her. In her office, she lays out the Jorge de Guzman file and tells her she knows that this is really Lalo Salamanca. This has all come to light because he was killed in a massive firefight at his compound. Kim does a good job of acting surprised about the revelation and wants to know why she's telling her about it. They go back and forth, 
Kim reminds her that she called Jimmy a scumbag, and Erickson admits that she has problems with Saul, but she also believes underneath it all, underneath all this showiness, he's a lawyer and a human being, and she thinks he knows what's right. She just described the character in a nutshell, which shows she has some pretty good instincts, only here she's coming to Kim because she thinks she's the more reasonable of the two which isn't exactly clear at this particular moment in the story. Lalo being dead is actually good news, but it also brings the situation back up when Kim has been so tightly focused on Howard. You see his car pull up at the valet at Fork, a real creature of habit, this guy. As the attendant does his job, you see Huell's plan unfold. In a bump that resembles the beginning of the end of another McGill, he gets a hold of the keys. His guy has to act fast to cut a copy of the key and spoof the electronic fob. It's thrilling to watch as the attendant rushes back to the car, but as you might guess, it all works out in the end. He passes off the device to Jimmy and gets his payment, and before he leaves, he asks if he can ask him a personal question. He can't understand why Jimmy and his wife with their legit jobs, where they do just fine making legit money, would go out and do something like this. Jimmy thinks he isn't able to see the bigger picture. He knows this looks just like a normal scam, but says what they're doing is going to improve a lot of people's lives. It's the story they tell themselves, but it also feels like he's trying to convince himself as much as he's trying to convince the pickpocket in his passenger seat. Huell says if you say so, and the look on his face here mirrors the one that he makes at the end of the next scene. There, Kim is waiting at home, smoking and looking at the sticky notes when he comes in. He tells her Huell came through. Now they have a key. They can unlock and take Howard's car. And she tells him about her conversation with Erickson. She lays it out that Jimmy could break confidentiality and help them with their case, and he asks Kim what she thinks he should do. That's somewhat surprising, and I feel like it's another reminder that he's not completely recovered yet, but Kim's answer is what really blows your mind. Like she's done so many times in this series, she tells him he can make his own decision, but she explains the situation as him having a choice of being a friend of the cartel or a rat. Which, of course, there is some truth to that. He would have to look over his shoulder, even if the ADA kept her word and kept his involvement out of it. But if you think back to, like, season two, you would never imagine these words coming out of Kim's mouth. And the way she's presenting it, she's not really giving him a choice. And that's where things are left with them. So wow, we're only at episode 3, and one of the series' big mysteries, what would happen to Nacho, has been addressed. We got what I think was a very good ending, though certainly not a happy one. I mentioned in the live stream we did last week that I couldn't imagine a way he could get out of this, so I knew on some level that this was probably coming, but seeing it play out is a different thing altogether. I suppose the other side of things here is a little less exciting, but there were some interesting bits to ponder with what's happening between Jimmy and Kim, and I believe it made sense to make this episode mostly about Nacho. His situation is really extreme, but I also find it relatable in a detached kind of way, which adds to the connection to the character, and man, you have to give it to Michael Mando, he really brought it in this episode. I think he's always been fantastic. He seems to always come through, no matter what they give him. And here he just solidifies his place as one of the better characters in any TV show over the last 10 years. If you think about the chain of events that happened to get all those characters in that same place. Gus was involved with something in Chile, but manages to make it out. He tries to connect with the cartel, and Hector kills Max on their behalf to teach him a lesson. Nacho gets involved with the Salamancas. He brings Mike in to take care of Tuco after he becomes a problem. That has Mike end up going after Hector because of the Good Samaritan. Gus intervenes there because he doesn't want that to happen. Nacho tries to kill Hector. Gus intervenes again so that he can torture him while using that knowledge to control Nacho. Then he involves him in his plan to try to kill Lalo, and here we are, with Nacho giving up his life to try to protect his father, the one innocent man in this entire equation. Nacho as a character was born from Jimmy's throwaway line in the desert, and they managed to turn that into something. I'm not sure that I can get from where we're at to Jimmy bringing up his name in the desert yet. I think there might be more that has to happen. I mean, obviously something will happen with Lalo, and I think there should be a reason why he says Ignacio in that scene. 
But as far as who he became, everything that led up to this final scene made sense. I didn't want to see him go, but I liked that he knew that Mike would protect his father. That's a major accomplishment considering what he was up against at the beginning of this episode. And as I mentioned before, he did manage to go out on his own terms. After the last episode, I was wondering how they were going to deal with the idea that Hector knows that Lalo's still alive and is thinking that Gus tried to kill him. I mean, correctly, of course, but that wouldn't have made a lot of sense considering things that we saw later in the story. It felt like at some time that might blow up in his face in relation to the cartel if Hector knew that. I think the way that it played out here, Nacho was able to sell the idea that Gus really wasn't involved with what happened. He turned it all on himself, and it was so satisfying to see him turn things around on the Salamancas before he took himself out. Snatching their chance to make him pay right out from under them, and then having the cousins carry Hector over to fire rounds into his dead body was the perfect way to show that he won. And he still managed to hold on to his honor in a sort of sideways fashion in the strange world they inhabit. It's interesting to think of Mike's journey in relation to Nacho as well. Mike's been on his descent, and Nacho reached out to him when he was first trying to think about how to get out of the life. Mike wouldn't kill anyone at that time, in the game or not, and we've been watching how his code has been changing. Nacho never really became something else, or at least he could never get away either. So this bond they have, even in this dark chapter, is kind of fascinating. At a time, they were kind of moving in different directions, both of them trying to be better, but they still ended up here despite those efforts. On the other side, Kim is focused, and Jimmy's a little harder to pin down. It's still feeling quite difficult to understand why they think they can just keep doing this kind of stuff without Howard figuring out it's them that's doing it. I mean, they're stealing his car. That's set up now. They have the spoof device. They're going to be able to take it. How do they get him to not know it was them? Unless it is all part of their plan, and then that's where things will get interesting. I really like what they did with Huel here, and I like the way that they had Erickson point out what we know to be true about Jimmy, and even offer a path that might pull him back on the right side of things. But then just have Kim shoot that down. Obviously, Jimmy is afraid of the cartel, and he's not going to choose the path of the rat. I mean, it probably would be ill-advised either way, but the offer being there serves as a reminder for Kim and for us that Saul is drifting farther away from the Jimmy we met in Season 1. And I think that's a good place to leave things. I'll definitely be making some more Better Call Saul videos this week, so let me know in the comments what you think about what happened, how you think they handled closing out Nacho's story, what you think is going to happen next. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.